But if you put a handpan in their hands and you say, play that emotion, you, you get something that comes from the heart. I mean, you know, whatever that emotion is, positive, negative, triumphant, um, whatever it is, it comes from the heart juju. <laughs> so that's the magic of this instrument in a lot of ways. Um, I kind of joke with people sometimes that it's a, it's a gateway instrument because you don't have to think about chords and scales and everything else. You can just make beautiful music as soon as you get a basic technique down. big question is this, how do we take a seemingly ordinary world and make it beyond extraordinary? In yoga, there is so much more than meets the eye, and it's not just the things we do on our yoga mats that make the biggest difference. That is the question, and this podcast will give you the answer. My name is Austin Bitsis, and welcome to Life as a Secret Yogi. Hello and welcome to Life is a Secret Yogi. This is your host, Austin Bitsis, and today we have a special and unique guest for you. This episode, you may have noticed, is a little longer than usual, but totally worth every minute of it. This episode is an ultimate guide on all things handpans. You hear that right now in the background? That, my friend, is the beautiful sound of the handpan played by today's guest, Mark Garner, the founder of Siraz, his company that builds handpans. Mark is the perfect person to demystify this mystical UFO-looking instrument. He has a background as a musician and a percussionist who later turned handpan builder in 2011, creating his company, Siraz. We will talk about his story to discovering the handpan, to ultimately learning upon his practice of yoga, qigong, and meditation over the past years to overcome injuries brought on by building handpans and integrating mindfulness into his building. It's this balance between yin and yang we talk about. Next, we dive into demystifying the handpan itself. By demystifying, I mean we discuss the history, the terminology, is it the hang, or the hung, the handpan, what variations are there out there, what are the differences you may have heard of, uh, like I just mentioned, the hung, the handpan, the tank drum, the space drum, the tongue drum, the rave drum. How do you tell all these all apart, right? How handpan exactly works, why are handpans so expensive, how does one learn to play the handpan, is it hard to learn? Are there any types of handpans uh, for different music? Did you know there was a stainless steel handpan and a normal steel handpan? Do you need a stand when you play the handpan? How do you travel with the handpan? How big is it? What is the weight? Is there a special way to clean a handpan? Are handpans durable? How to tune a handpan? Are there handpan meeting groups or gatherings? And what other resources are out there? Festivals, online training courses. There's so much to learn. And those are just a few of the topics we cover. Basically, everything you need to know about the handpan is the ultimate handpan guide from Mark Gurner's experience through his thousands of hours of building and playing handpans. Mark is authentic in his words and truly a genuine figure. He speaks from a point of view of love and compassion. I'm truly grateful to have spoken to him and share it with you all listening. This episode is 110% worth it if you have any interest at all in learning about the handpan. Plus, in the following episode, Mark was kind enough to play us a piece on the handpan, which is his take on meditation. It's basically a sound bath, if you've ever taken a sound bath. However, if you're ever doubting the beauty in life, simply go back to that episode and listen to that episode over and over again. It'll change your perspective each and every time. So without further ado, enjoy this episode with Mark Garner of Siraz Handpants. Um, Cheers, Austin. Thanks so much for having me. I uh, really, it's quite an honor to be on your show. Thanks. Yeah, um, no, I appreciate it. And I guess let's start off with just your story to finding and creating Purpose through yoga, meditation, um, you mentioned you even practice Qigong and you create handpans. So can you take us back to first discovering the pan art 
Art Han Hang uh, in 2011 while living in Switzerland? Sure, sure. Um, let's see, to clarify, I guess, I first heard about the instrument around 2005. A friend of mine had seen one at Burning Man. And then I, uh, I worked at a volunteer at a Sufi meditation camp in Switzerland in 2009 for a few months. And uh, one of the people there had one that I ended up spending some time with and playing on for the first time. And, um, and I was, of course, blown away. I've been a percussionist for um, all my adult life and since a teenager. And so at that point, it was already like absolutely impossible to get a hung. Uh, they were, since about 2006, they were 90, maybe 5% of the demand they were actually satiating. And uh, so, I, you know, I thought it was cool, but kind of just wrote it off as something I'd never have. And uh, then when I came back to Asheville, not long after that, I discovered a good friend here, uh, Rusty James, had been way into this thing for a while. And so he was kind of instrumental in me getting into it. He started one of the first gatherings of hand pan players around North America here in Asheville, uh, invited me out as one of the only people who didn't actually have an instrument. And, and, uh, and I got a chance to meet uh, Kyle Cox and Jim Dusen of Pantheon Steel, which were one of the earliest um, alternative builders to pan art. And um, so they were talking at the time about uh, potentially helping some people get it started building uh, because they also had could barely satiate 1% of the demand at that point. And uh, so I was kind of in a place in my life where I had some money and uh, wanted to do something different and um, was really inspired by the instrument. I felt like I'd been practicing my whole life to play this thing. And um, it seemed like the ultimate amalgamation of like, okay, here's a no brainer business strategy. There's a great demand. Um, but this is making art, and these instruments are more than just uh, musical instruments. They're, um, they have a magic to them, uh, as a lot of people discover. And so um, I dove in head first and got way too deep to turn around, <laughs> to sum it up. Yeah, definitely. And then in 2011, you kind of purchased your, your first hand pan. And we'll, we'll kind of, so the the goal of this episode for everybody listening is to really kind of uncover and demystify the hand pan or the hang or however you might think of them and kind of clarify what are the differences what's the purposes and the, the audience uh, who's listening right now might be somebody like me who two years ago saw it in a yoga class being used and googling um, what is this a like, ufo drum looking thing and basically from that i um, came across the hang pan and I got more interested in it and I found that you were creating them. And when I had the idea for the show, I was like, I have to have yourself on to kind of clarify what it is and what the purpose is, because even everything on the internet is still kind of confusing. Um, until I even spoke with you and you kind of handed me down that blog post where it just clarifies um, the differences between different terminologies. I guess back to your story, through creating Siraz, are there any particular positions um, or opinions in the last few years uh, that have changed or shifted substantially um, through your journey from discovering the handpan and then now creating them and creating music from them? I have, yeah, um, a few of them. Uh, the first one that really comes to mind is probably integrates really well with um, this, the theme of this podcast building hand pans and a sense of uh, mental, emotional, and self-realization and physical realization of mindfulness that um, is integral to doing this work. And, um, you know, to give you like um, the start of the ground, right? The start of the physical side of it. Um, hammering on steel is uh, no small undertaking. You know, you'll if you look at blacksmithers, they're typically a certain body type. Um, which I'm not, you know, I'm a uh, six foot high and about 150, 560 pounds, not built to be a blacksmith. Like monkeys weren't really made to bang on steel all day. And um, so it takes a special kind. And so being kind of uh, maybe type A and high strung and uh, really focused on doing this, I dove in really deep in the beginning. And, uh, and I learned my limits um, was one position change. Um, I learned my physical limits. And, you know, you think about like everybody's probably hammered a nail in at some point in time. Um, it takes a certain degree of um, intention, focus. You've got to really hit the nail with the hammer, not your thumb or your fingers. Uh, but, you know, you consider from a, a yogic a mindful standpoint, um, what is your muscles doing in that action? You're tightening up, you're slinging force, you're hammering into this thing. 
Um, for perspective and a handpan note, um, on a good day, every single note's going to take at least three or four hundred hammer strikes. Um, on a bad day, it could take two or three thousand, easy. And it's not a simple uh, job to get multiple frequencies in tune on a single note, so it can also be incredibly frustrating. Um, it's a mental challenge um, to line up multiple variables at the same time, um, to corral them all in together to get this thing to come into tune together. And when it doesn't go well, it can be incredibly emotionally frustrating. And, uh, and I share all this backstory with you um, to say that basically every single hand pan builder I've, I've talked to, which I'm friends with a number of them, having gotten into this really early on, including myself, have had moments where we like turn into a, a five-year-old having a temper tantrum, ready to scream and yell at the thing in incredible amounts of frustration. And uh, it's been a while since I've had that experience, a number of years, but... Um, this is one of the things that I've really uh, learned a great deal about uh, life and myself and everything else I do um, is being forced to see uh, my limits mentally, physically, and emotionally. And I, as we might talk about, you know, I really got into yoga and Qigong only a couple of years ago. I mean, I've you know, done a little bit of yoga here and there for 15 or 20 years, but I got into it as a serious practice a couple of years ago. And it, um, it really changed my life, to be completely honest. Um, after being, after going through a number of physical injuries from pushing myself too hard, serious pulled back muscles, one of which put me in the hospital, um, stopped me from working for three months, um, to learn to stretch and to elasticate my muscles and not just be completely pent up in tension all the time. Uh, but then, I mean, as a physical thing, uh, has created I, I can probably work 1,500% more now than I could three years ago uh, because of simply doing yoga. Um, now, additionally, though, uh, mentally and emotionally, it's come with powerful changes. And I think it was about a year ago that I, I was, one day it dawned on me that I've always built handpans from a very yang mindset, a very like intentional, you know, I'm getting this thing in tune um, egoic, um, focus of, um, hammering the nail in the wall. And, you know, and I've done it for a while, so my muscles know how to do it. And I mentally understand what's going on. And I've developed a really good architecture that ultimately wants to be in tune if I'll tune it in the right way. Uh, so, you know, everything is going for me to suddenly think about this from a really yin standpoint, to be, um, entirely as mindful as possible in the process to feel every muscle in my body um, as one, one integrated organism, to um, feel the hammer as an extension of my body, and to therefore feel the vibrations in the steel uh, as the hammer impacts it. And to, instead of come at it with this mindset of like, I'm gonna get you in tune, to come at it with this mindset of where is it and listen to it entirely instead of having any intention and to more caress it or even seduce it or just mindfully listen to it to see where it is. And almost like immediately, like on that instrument immediately, uh, suddenly notes took um, 60, 70% less energy uh, to get in tune because I wasn't blowing past opportunities anymore, like being lost in a habitual routine, lost in a habitual habit. Um, I was actually paying attention to what was going on in the now, uh, both in myself and in the steel. And, you know, uh, while that was an epiphany for building a handpan, um, it's something that reflects really a change in myself and my mindset and everything in life um, up to that point and something that's only grown more since then and continues to grow. And if anything, it's probably my number one focus at this point um, to be to be present, to be uh, mindful and what we're doing, whether we're having a conversation like you and I are, or hanging out in the forest, watching the, the leaves blow in the breeze, or um, listening to our loved ones and the things they really want to share with us and our friends or whatever it may be in life, you know, to find that balance of yin and yang, to be a witness and also to put forth and express um, what we have to express in our world. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a long diatribe for your answer, but... <laughs> Um, that's the first thing that really came to mind with of a, a huge personal change and repositioning of epiphany that I've gotten out of it. Yeah. And I think that's exactly what this show is all about is about taking uh, the practice of yoga, meditation, and mindfulness, whatever you may call it, uh, off the mat. So if you, you practice on the mat and people practice the physical benefits, that's great. 
And that really teaches you the mental benefits of being more mindful in your movement. And that's truly is yoga. If you're lifting weights, if you're going for a run, it's matching breath with movement and mindfulness. And that is yoga. Um, so you're really expressing what it is to take it off the mat and being more mindful in your movements. And at the same time, the balance between yin and yang, where it's riding your edge and knowing what your edge is, if that's pushing yourself or if that's pulling yourself back, everyone thinks it's when they think of edge, they think of like, how close can I get to failure? But at the same time, sometimes there's two edges or most of the time there's two edges where it's like on one end, it's like, how far can I push myself? The other end is like, it might be harder to rest or it might be harder to do something that's uncomfortable, which a lot for a lot of people is rest, especially for yourself. Like you said, you were a type personality, um, like myself, who's go, 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 go. And, um, realizing that sometimes that's harder. Riding that edge is harder because the other edge comes naturally. Um, Absolutely, mate. Absolutely. Learning to just be, to just, sit in a room and do absolutely nothing for a type A person. It's like a incredible task as you probably know. And, um, but it's also incredibly freeing to come to a point of like, wow, I don't really need to be doing anything. I don't need to be thinking. I don't, you know, to find that, that sense of peace that can come with that is truly profound. Yeah, no, exactly. And it, it is incredibly hard. And, um, I, I think one advantage of myself for teaching it and, um, expressing my, kind of like my Dharma thoughts in the beginning of a a lot of these episodes is that I do come from that background where it's not natural for me. Like it's not natural that I just can just sit like ever since I've been little, it's been so hard to be able to just sit still, relax and do nothing. Even when I'm doing nothing, I'm thinking and I'm thinking of the next steps and I'm planning out whatever, but having what kind of works for people like ourselves who have extremely active minds and sharing that knowledge is definitely something that help. I mean, in, in general, but what is the power of integrating the handpan music into a spiritual practice? So you mentioned it a little bit before in the creation of the handpan and getting more mindful in your movements over the past couple of years by integrating kind of yoga, meditation, mindfulness into your work. But I guess just as a music in general, for about a year now, you mentioned you were exploring sound therapy and with practitioners that use, um, your Syrah's hand pans in their work. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, we've, uh, we've been working on a series called More Than Music, and um, we're interested in really just what's been happening for a number of years. Um, early on, I noticed a lot of my customers would write me back and say, um, I love the instrument. I'm taking it into hospitals and playing for people. I'm taking it to hospice and playing for people. I'm, I'm taking it to my school and playing for people. Um, one customer is a nurse in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, he uh, takes his instrument to work every single day and plays for patients and, um, and not always to relax them. Um, actually, he told me about sometimes they have, uh, forgive me, I think it's called a code yellow, where a patient's completely freaking out, ripping you know, wires and tubes and whatever out of their body, and every nurse is called into the room. And as he put it, there's usually some blood involved somewhere, and he usually comes running with his handpan. Uh, you know, I thought, okay, well, this is kind of random. And uh, he said that while if he comes in and he starts playing, it's usually annoying to the patient, but it completely grabs their attention. And while their attention's grabbed, all the other nurses can get everything else back under control. And I feel like while that's a really um, negative example, um, it's right in tune with all the other examples that I've seen, whether it was a um, recent episode with a psychologist a uh, recent um, episode from last year with a sound healer when we're about to do release with a yoga teacher. It grabs people's attention is what's interesting. And it, it pulls them into the moment, it pulls them into the now. And I mean, I, you know, I've, I've been building these things for eight years. So I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about, well, like, what is it about specifically the, uh, the handpan that grabs people's attention so um, strongly? I mean, you know, we've all seen a guitar and we like them, but it doesn't, it seems to be different. And I mean, of course it's not everybody, but overwhelmingly I've seen this numerous times, even myself playing on a street where, you know, someone will take the the double take and then they stop in their tracks and come walking over. And what is that thing? And, you know, in the classic, like you see one on YouTube and people are like, I must find out what this is. So 
I feel like um, one of the dominant themes we're coming to discover with all these people is that it gets people out of their head. Um, the interview with um, uh, counselor Rob Jacoby, um, who I've known for a little while, who's been using our instruments in his um, counseling practice here in Asheville, um, he sold a number of really great stories about um, some of his clients that, you know, they're wrapped up in their... Um, their trip, whatever it is, you know, they're wrapped up in their mental dialogue and their emotional dialogue and their habits. Um, and maybe that's depression or maybe that's um, chronic frustration or stress, you know, in a fight flight mindset. And then he gets them into the office and he puts a hand pan in their hands and, you know, finds out they play a little piano and they play and 45 minutes later, they like come back and they realize, Oh, right life is not this emotional um, intoxication, for lack of a better word, or um, ongoing habit. Um, there's a world. There's, oh yeah, here I am. Oh yeah, there's the trees. Oh, here's this person talking to me. It's not just um, run through this filter of um, strong emotion, or for that matter, strong dogma or thoughts. Um, so, you know, I feel like it's... Um, you know, like I said, it's not it's not a hundred percent universal. Um, some people don't have any interest in it, but a lot of people it really touches them deeply and it brings them to this place of presence of mindfulness. As a as a player personally, it's an interesting experience. Um, one of my friends, Colin Folk, who also builds handpans um, out in California, he has a classic saying that's um, "Play now and think later," and uh, it was one of the first quotes I heard about the handpan um, when I got into it. And uh, he was a pretty well-known player at the time, teaching people some of the more advanced techniques online. And uh, I think it really says a lot um, because this instrument, it's only one scale. And so, you know, it's not like a piano where you've got all the notes and you can just create a cacophony of nonsense if you play all the keys. It's not like a guitar in the same sense. Um, you can't really hit a wrong note. And I mean, of course, you know, there's a couple notes that are gonna create more tension if they're only a half step apart but it's still just one scale. It's a major scale. It's a minor scale. It might be a harmonic minor scale or mixolydian or Dorian or whatever, but it's one scale. And in that regard, it's going to have a certain emotion to it. You know, uh, the major scale is going to have a somewhat happy emotion to it. A minor scale is going to have a more mysterious or dark emotion to it. Uh, mixolydian might be triumphant. Um, but either way, whatever it is, you don't have to think about it. Um, when you play, you don't have to think, I'm going from G to C to D to A minor back to G like you would on a guitar or a piano. Um, you can think about it, of course, and um, write some beautiful compositions that way, but you don't have to. And so a lot of people don't think about it at all when they play. I typically probably think about what notes I'm playing 2% of the time when I play handpan. Um, and so from the rest of the time, people are coming at it from a more um kinetic um such as percussive um rhythmic mindset or they're coming at it from a more emotional mindset and one of the things that really touched me the most about um our interview with rob uh, the counselor was you know he said you know you can ask a client as a counselor you can ask him and say hey you know how do you how do you feel right now tell me about your internal emotions and they might use all kinds of words and say oh i feel sad or i feel happy or i feel angry or i feel stressed out but if you put a handpan in their hands and you say, play that emotion, you, you get something that comes from the heart. I mean, you know, whatever that emotion is, positive, negative, triumphant, um, whatever it is, it comes from, comes from the, the heart juju. <laughs> so it's, um, it's a different thing in that regard. Uh, and I feel like to really bring this all back around, that's the magic of this instrument in a lot of ways. Um, I kind of joke with people sometimes that it's a, it's a gateway instrument um, because you don't have to think about chords and scales and everything else. You can just make beautiful music as soon as you get a basic technique down. And it's, I think it's, it's really undiscovered in, in terms of the amount of people that know it that would be interested in it. But you've been creating it for eight years and I think still where it's becoming more well known and used within say like the yoga community, uh, meditation community, it's still not as well known as it could be. And for the beautiful music it makes, and, and this is all new to me, I, I've never personally played it. Uh, I never had the the opportunity, the chance to do that. But just from listening to it myself, I'm just like, this is beautiful. And I think so many people would resonate with it. And it reminds me similar uh, when listening to it of say doing like a sound bath. And for me, like we were just talking about like active minds that really helps me meditate. 
sound baths, like guided meditations for myself that, that also helps, but something about a sound bath just gets me into this world. And it's like, into this present moment and into my mind, into this like, um, like beautiful world. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's like the saying this, there's no ordinary moments. And, uh, when you learn to be present, uh, life's beautiful, life all around you. Um, and, as I say on the show, it's like we take a seemingly ordinary world and uh, make it extraordinary, which it is. Truly. Yeah. And in the mid-2014, you started the Siraz Foundation to kind of promote what you're similar to what you're talking about, um, sponsor music education, environmental sustainability, um, and health, happy, and balanced life. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more uh, how you've been working with the Siraz Foundation and why you started that? Sure. I mean, when I got into making hand pans in the very beginning, it was, like I said, it was multifold. I mean, it's it's good to have a job that'll pay the bills, um, but it was also awesome to find something that um, is artistic and creative um, to do for a living. But uh, more than anything, you know, to come back to the, I really do feel these instruments are more than just musical instruments. Um, they touch people and they inspire people. And so I felt like a way to take that forward even further was to um, move forward with the Saras Foundation um, to really get involved in uh, more educational endeavors. Um, we we sponsored um, the Lake Eden Arts Festival that happens in Asheville. And it's an awesome, awesome festival. Um, great world music festival. Um, but they... Typically, uh, most of their profits go towards um, music education around the world and locally. And uh, so the year we sponsored them, they ended up using the money to um, purchase a very appropriate um, steel drum set for a group down in Guatemala, um, some kids down in Guatemala, um, to expand on their orchestra. And um, we've done some work with um, the Asheville Percussion Festival as well, who brings in all sorts of top-notch percussionists and um, teaches workshops um, for a week-long um, event and then puts on a performance at the end of it. Um, and then we've done some other like completely different things for environmental organizations. And, and um, I mean, it's really like, you know, I mean, what, what do you do with your money, Austin? You know, I mean, at some point it's like, I don't need another car. I don't need another house. I don't need to go to Target and spend uh, $500 every week. So, uh, you know, spread it around a bit and do something um, different with it. It's, it's given an opportunity as well to connect with really different, interesting subcultures and groups uh, and learn more and more about what's going on in the world. Yeah. And when you die, your, your money doesn't come with you. So uh, once you have uh, you your know. needs met, I think it's really important and to make sure you're kind of spreading that positive energy and I mean, we're all one and kind of creating a happy world around you and having that compound effect makes yourself happier, makes the people around you happier and makes kind of the world go around. Like they, they, they say, um, truly. And I think that's, that's amazing for the next section. I have a bunch of questions about the hand pan starting with the history and then we kind of could dive into the different variations. So I'll call this section like hand pan or hang or 101. So uh, before we <laughs> classify it, what it is, can we just start from the top of like how it was created? What's really the history behind it? Sure, sure. Um, let me just uh, absolutely pay respects to where this thing ultimately comes from. Um, very briefly say, I personally consider the history started in Trinidad um, about a hundred years ago with Toon Steel. And I, I'll leave it, you know, pretty simple at that. It's really an inspiring, amazing story of oppression and people rising up and developing the only acoustic instrument of the 20th century, the only new acoustic instruments of the 20th century. Um, pan art um, were one of the people who brought the steel drum, uh, steel pan, as a lot of people also refer to it, um, to Europe. And uh, they did that in, don't quote me on exactly the dates, I believe it was in the later 60s, early 70s. Um, I want to say the early 70s mainly. And um, they're responsible for uh, building a number of sets in Germany and Switzerland. Um, particularly the Germans and the Swiss got really, really into the steel pan. And then uh, for the birth of the, the hung, um, it's spelled hang in uh, English, H-A-N-G, but um, the word actually means hand in um, Bernese German, um, and it's pronounced um, hung like H-U-N-G. There was a, 
percussionists that came to them around 2000. Um, the name's escaping me at the moment. Ardo, Ardo Weber, maybe. Um, anyways, he said, you know, I love the steel pan, but I really want to play it with my hands. And is there any way you can flip it upside down? And so um, Felix and Sabina, the original hung builders, they um, brewed on it for a little bit and they decided to try something. And so they basically took a steel drum and they flipped it upside down and then they glued it to the bottom of another one and um, made the first what was called the mother hung. And this thing was ginormous. Um, if anyone who's familiar with steel drums know they're about 10 inches deep. So this thing was like 20 inches tall versus, you know, the classic current, you know, 10-ish, 9-ish inch uh, tall uh, hand pan or hung. And uh, so anyways, they, this was about 2000 and they went on about five years of research where they reportedly made about 5,000 instruments, um, really churning them out by um, most people's standards. And uh, they were exploring all kinds of stuff and um, they're exploring different scales. Um, they really started to look into the more single scale concept versus like on the steel pan, it tends to be more chromatic. Um, you might have two or three that make a whole chromatic set, but there's not like a single major scale on a steel pan. Um, there wasn't really the intention there. So it was a very revolutionary idea to just make a single scaled instrument. And that went on until about 2005 and then YouTube came out and uh, somewhere around there and a few people put up some YouTube videos and over the course of about a year, it completely and utterly exploded. And um, they went from um, having distributors around the world who were selling them uh, to not able to satiate 5% of the demand. And when they created the, um, what was called the uh, second generation hung around uh, 2006-ish or so, I think there were about a thousand of those made. Um, they all went quite, quite quickly. And then from that point on, it was like, you know, to get your hands on a pan art hung was um, quite an achievement. Um, you had to go to Switzerland in person and buy one and burn um, at that point. And, uh, and it's pretty much been that way ever since until very recently when they've started to make other instruments and they're starting to ship them around the country, around the world again. So, um, what, is it a hung? Is it a hung drum? Is it a hand pan? Um, where does this all come from? Um, so, uh, the hung is technically a brand name, uh, and this is important, um, in respect to pan art, they don't want all these instruments called their own brand name. It'd be like calling every pair of shoes Nikes or, um, I'm in the South, you know, every soft drink is a Coke until you say what kind of Coke, Oh, I want a Pepsi, but they're all Cokes, right? Um, that's what they really wanted to avoid. And uh, so they wanted everyone else basically to come up with a different name. And um, uh, my good friend from Pantheon Steel, Kyle Cox, coined the name Handpan. And uh, Kyle had built steel pans for years before getting into building the handpan. And um, so he was really paying tribute to the history in Trinidad and um, Ellie Minette, who brought it um, up to North America, uh, in naming this thing more after the steel pan tradition. Uh, so... That happened around 2006 or seven. Don't quote me on like all these exact dates. I've probably got it written down somewhere when I researched it, but it's not stuck on the front of my head at the moment. And at that point, Pantheon was still playing around with prototypes. They launched their first instruments around uh, 2008-ish, uh, somewhere around there, 2009. Uh, there were a couple other builders that popped up. Um, there was a company called Bellard out of Spain that has since not made making instruments for about four or five years. Um, but they were out at the time. Um, there was uh, the Space Drum in France came out pretty early on. These were all right before 2010. And it, it was very slowly happening. And I mean, at this point, like, I don't know, it's hard to really put numbers on it, but maybe 500 instruments a year were being made and maybe 50 or 100,000 people in the world wanted one. And so a lot of people were trying. And um, so I got into it in 2011. This is when I first met Colin Jim from Pantheon Steel and, um, and got my hands on a halo and um, started to explore some of the other instruments I'd gotten the opportunity to play. And uh, so I think I was about like maybe the fifth person to build them. And over the course of the next few years, it continued to grow. By 2016, 2015, 2016, probably broke 100 builders. Um, by this point, wild guesses around three or 400. And it's, you know, it's kind of, um, I think it's probably 
probably coming up to like a saturation point, you know, just in seeing like basic supply and demand. I mean, the first two or three years we were turning down over a thousand people a year for an instrument because we couldn't build enough. Everyone was, um, at this point, you know, that doesn't really happen anymore. Um, a lot of, it's much more, um, traditional, um, industry, I guess. Um, people, I think a lot of people have discovered it's really hard to build them. It's also, it can be hard to sell them. Um, if you don't already have a, you know, reputation or a name or access and some capacity to, um, getting them out there. Um, so I like some big companies, some companies have gone out of business and, um, collaborated and combined and, you know, things have gotten more dynamic. Um, so ultimately most people call them hand pans in general. Um, there are some builders that also call them pantoms. Um, Pantom was a name that was used by, uh, I believe, an Israeli distributor of the Pan Art Hung. Uh, and they were, he was kind of combining the terms of pan, uh, the steel pan, and the, uh, the gatam, uh, an Indian uh, clay pot drum. Um, because the hand pan itself has a bit of a Helmholtz and a, a thud boom um, tone to it. Um, so I, a couple of builders have really gone with that term. I know of one player that wanted to call them cupolas for a while. I don't know if he still is. The naming was really a debate for a number of years. And it seems like in more recent days, people have kind of stopped arguing about it and just said, all right, yeah, it's whatever you're going to call it. And I'm just going to go play some hand pad. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. Just play it for the love of it. Yeah. There's so many types, I guess, for like the novice or somebody looking for it. I mean, you, you mentioned it's like the hung, pronounced the hung, mm-hmm. traditional pan art hung, uh, hand pan. Uh, I've also seen like, you, you mentioned like the space drum, but there's a tank drum, the tongue drum, the rave drum. I mean, of course, with the size, the physique and the look of them, but what's like the major difference between those? Are they kind of like a variation off that? Uh, or are they just kind of like a different look for a uh, similar th- thing in terms of sound and, and quality? Well, uh, you know, you're asking a builder, so you're going to get a, a builder's answer, right? In my personal opinion, tank drums, ravs, the hank drums, their similarities are that they're made out of metal and the notes are aligned in the same way. That's it. It's really a completely different instrument. Um, it is a much more economically um, affordable instrument. Um, because they're much easier to build. Um, they're basically to build a, a tongue drum. I mean, this is really, really simply um, said. I mean, like the rab drum is above and beyond the best um, tongue drum or tank drum that I've personally seen uh, because they tune the harmonics and everything else. There's a tremendous amount of innovation behind their product. Um, but it included the way you build these instruments is you cut a tongue into the steel. And, uh, and I first saw this concept probably with like a wooden box tongue drum um, back in the 90s. So the idea is that you have a vibrating tongue. You have a, a membrane that's attached uh, at 25% and the rest of it is vibrating um, with a hole cut around it and the rest of the steel. And its similarities with the handpan is that um, there's a lot of similar scales and the notes are lined up in a similar way on some of them, not all of them. So this is a big difference between it and a handpan. I mean, it's basically a completely and totally different technology. The handpan's built like the steel drum, the steel pan. Um, it's a single sheet of steel. There's no cuts in it at all anywhere. You find um, a membrane, a note, a tone field, uh, and this membrane has been created as like a, we'll call it a flat plane for simplicity, um, and an otherwise curved sheet of steel. Now, simplicity stops really fast um, in discussing the difference because it's actually what's called a parabola, um, which for those who aren't uh, geometry whizzes, um, a parabola, uh, think of a Pringle potato chip. And so if you look at it, there's two or three millimeters of deviation um, across the membrane and there's a short axis and a long axis in this membrane. And so, you know, you can imagine there's a short axis and a long axis in the Pringle potato chip. As you change the curvature, the thickness of the Pringle potato chip, how much curvature there is, is how you tune the harmonics. And basically that in combination with the size of the Pringle potato chip will tune the fundamental. And of course, tension is a big variable of this as well. Um, If you have a guitar, I mean, you know, if you see a guitar in the corner, for all you know, it's the most beautifully tuned guitar in the world until you go and strum the strings and realize it hasn't been tuned in 10 years. Um, and that's tension in the strings. So the same thing's playing out in the steel. 
And this is the trick of tuning the handpan, and this is why they're somewhere between three and 10 times more expensive than a tongue drum, is um, every single hammer strike is changing all of these things. It's changing the tension in the membrane. It's um, changing the shape of the parabola. And so in tuning one, you don't do it as a linear process. You don't like tune the fundamental and then tune the um, two harmonics each individually. You have to tune everything all at one time and kind of corral them all in together. And I guess I should probably back up one step and say a lot of tongue drums are just one tone in that tongue, and there will be harmonics that are untuned. With the exception of the rab, they actually tune some of the harmonics and the cuts. Um, whereas with uh, any, at least in my opinion, uh, acceptable quality, um, hand pan's gonna have at least three notes tuned into each note. Um, there's the membrane that's gonna be a fundamental note that's vibrating up and down. And then the Pringle potato chip, it's got a short axis and a long axis. And so there's gonna be two harmonics. There's gonna be a harmonic on the long axis and a harmonic on the short axis. And the magic, coming back around to like, why do these things captivate people and grab them? Um, I hypothesize that part of the reason is because of how it's tuned. Um, along with the steel pan, it's the only instrument I'm currently aware of that tunes in a perfect one, two, three ratio. Um, the, um, the wave length of the fundamental is exactly twice the size of the wavelength of the long axis harmonic. And it's exactly three times the size of the short axis harmonic. So you have this like perfect ratio of one, two, three um, coming out of every single note. And what I've learned about in psychology is that our brains, and we try to make sense out of the soundscape around us, um, the brain's constantly looking for simplified ratios to focus on and to clear out all the static nonsense. So when the brain hears the hand pan, it's like candy. It's like, oh, oh wow, every single frequency is the most primary basic one, two, three ratio. This thing is amazing. Um, versus like listening to just pure static is very quickly boring um, for the opposite reason. So maybe that explains uh, some of the difference between tongue drums and ravs and tank drums and hand pans. Yeah, definitely. I think also you explaining about the, uh, the business of it and the supply and the demand and kind of where it's came from. And um, as you mentioned, as someone like myself, uh, I feel that it's still f farly undiscovered where you, you, you were kind of saying that it's almost reached a saturation point at, at times. And it makes sense why all these different variations come in when there's all this demand and not enough supply. And it makes sense why there's not enough supply. It's a complicated, complex, it's an art to create the hand pan. And um, while these other variations that might be slightly more simple or just in terms of building kind of came into play and uh, different size, different variations and people put their own spin on it. If, if somebody is like, would like to integrate it into their yoga class, um, if they're a teacher, or maybe they just like to have one around the, around the house and, and, and play it as a, a form of uh, meditation, is it hard to learn? I think it's one of the easiest instruments I've ever tried to pick up. And um, the, biggest, the biggest trick is you have to learn how to get your fingers off of it, not onto it. Um, it's all about a bounce. It's like touching a hot pan to see, is it really hot? Um, and, I, you know, what I'll tell people when I give like a, some basic lessons sometimes, I, I tell people, try to pull the sound out. Don't try to put it in. Um, because if you, like if you play a djembe, for example, you know, a drum or a conga or something, often you'll slap your hand down on it and hold your hand there. And that's exactly what you cannot do on a hand pan. You have to bounce your hand off of it and really bounce your fingers off of it. Um, it you know, I mean, I, I got paid percussion for, I don't know, 15 or so years before I got into it. It still took me a good five or 10 minutes to start to get a feel for it. And it really took me a, a year to get a really sensitive touch to it. And, you know, maybe a year or two to start to master some of the more complex techniques. Um, but within five or 10 minutes, I was making awesome, fun, beautiful music. And, you know, compare that to, say, um, a piano, uh, maybe a middle ground where you're playing with 10 fingers and you're trying to think across 10 fingers. Or you're thinking about, say, a guitar where you're 
you know, playing on the top end, uh, whatever the chord progression is, and you're learning a strum pattern on the other side. Um, it's much more complex. Um, and being able to build calluses and build the chords um, with your fingers. Think about playing a violin or any bowed instrument. Um, I really, if you've ever tried to bow anything, uh, you'll quickly have an amazing appreciation for anyone who can play these things well. Um, it might take three months to just get one decent note out of a bowed instrument uh, to get the bowing technique, you know, really beautiful. So it stops squeaking and squealing like crazy with just horrible, horrible sounds. Um, so, you know, relative to all these things, um, I think it's really one of the easiest instruments uh, ever that I've tried to play. And this is one of the reasons I often call it kind of like a, a gateway instrument. I'm, I'm surprised by how many people have never played anything. And uh, they get a hand pan and they, after six months, they're like, oh, well, now I want a different scale and I want a different one. Or uh, after a year or two, they decide they're going to take up the guitar um, because they've gotten so much out of creating music with the hand pan. It was so much easier. Um, so yeah, I think it's pretty easy. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I appreciate any type of music so much. Um, it's not something that I put into practice myself. My appreciation is there. And especially as I get older, like kind of the desire to learn, but it's good to know that this is one of the instruments that I find the most fascinating and um, it's easy to learn. So <laughs> definitely helped me as, as a total novice um, when it co comes to all things musical. But um, are there any types of hand pans for say different music? Well, let's see, look at this question a few different ways. Uh, there's a general tone and timbre that comes out of most of the notes, but you know, we do a lot of different scales. Um, so they can be utilized in really different music um, and styles of music. Um, I've heard everything from digital music integrating it to um, uh, Ringo Starr did a piece, pretty poppy song recently. Um, Bjork's done a lot of music with one, um, Paul Simon. Um, there's a lot of really interesting folks that have um, explored different things with it. For the most part, it's a pretty straightforward um, sound you can alter it in different ways. There's little dimples in the middle of the notes um, So it can be more steel drum like or less steel drum like um, It can have more of like a wow wow kind of quality to it or more just like very pure tone about it What really opens up the door that you might be thinking uh, considering is um, If you put a pickup on one then you can run all sorts of effects into the sound and do virtually anything imaginable with it um, I've seen like in a particular piece of steel, I've seen a couple of interesting things being done um, of like uh, one guy try putting some strings on the hole underneath. So it would create like a little bit of drone sound that came out uh, in some degree. Um, you know, people are exploring. I've seen uh, some strings like a guitar neck added to one before. And of course, the notes on the handpan will um, be activated by the strings when they hit the same tone. Um, so, you know, so people are trying some really interesting things. Yeah. I'm just like imagining that in my head right now. It kind of looks like a, almost like a, imagining a banjo right now, like, like a guitar kind of long strings attached to like this, uh, hand pan at the end with the strings. Is that kind of what you're talking about? Totally. Exactly. Um, yeah, that, that's awesome. I mean, in the ones you particularly make, is it pretty straightforward or do you kind of make them custom? We almost do entirely custom to order. Um, maybe 5% these days, I'll slip in a couple instruments here and there, something I want to build, or um, if I have any extra time, I'll typically build a extra D minor because uh, those tend to be the most popular and um, not everybody wants to wait three or four months for their instrument to be built for them, which is um, typically what it takes us. And uh, so, you know, we'll sometimes have one immediately available um, here and there. Um, we, let's see, going back to your other question, there's a couple different, in the last year or so, there's a couple different um, styles of handpans being built um, that we do as well. There's uh, traditional instruments that um, tend to um, have a bit more uh, ceramic quality sound to them versus bright and blary sound like a uh, steel drum. And then in recent years, the last two years, I guess, people start building them out of stainless steel. And um, we do as well. We call it our meditation series. And it's a really different sound and tone than our traditional um, professional instruments or our um, enthusiast instruments that are that more ceramic sound. 
the stainless steel is about twice the sustain. And um, so it kind of has a bit more dreamy quality about it. And I find like a lot of people think, oh, that sounds amazing. Why don't you just build those? Um, a lot of people prefer them. Uh, we probably do 50 or 60 percent of our instruments are on stainless steel these days um, because people like that dreamy meditative quality. They can hit a note and listen to it for five or six or seven seconds and really let the tone breathe and play, especially for yoga classes or sound meditations or whatnot, sound baths. Um, they're really, really ideal. Um, but then some people come at this instrument more from a percussion background and, you know, they want to play 150 beats a minute, um, 200 beats a minute. A um, uh, great player I can think of right now is Adrian Portilla in Australia. Guys like I'm, I'm not entirely sure if he's actually human and from planet Earth. I think he might be from a different galaxy with the amount of skill he has. Um, but uh, he's he's known for playing very quickly and um, and fast and. Um, so sometimes that style is better on the more traditional instrument that has more of that ceramic quality because it might only have um, three to five seconds of sustain, whereas the uh, stainless instruments are going to have seven or eight or nine or even 10 seconds of sustain. And, and to really carry this forward into like the rap drum or the, um, the tank drums, they'll typically have even longer sustain um, and a bit different tone and quality about them, a bit more thuddy, but um, a sustain that could be 15 or 20 seconds long. Uh, so, you know, you're starting to almost get towards like a wind chime kind of um, sustain, of, um, which is perfect for a, a dreaminess, if that's what the player's after. Mm -hmm. And the one that um, you sent over, that, that audio file, which for everyone listening, it will be in the episode after this um, as a kind of sound bath meditation that um, anybody listening can do. Um, was that made with the stainless steel? Drum? It was, indeed. Um, and is that generally what you kind of find in say like a yoga class or a meditation class? Like you just said, it's more of that kind of sustained meditation type. When our customers ask us, it's what we typically recommend, but we're also very careful to not make decisions for people. <clears throat> We've learned to really encourage everyone to watch some videos and to see what speaks to them because, you know, it's one of the other interesting things I've learned about music and myself the scales that I personally love are not necessarily the scales that you're going to love or that any other customer is going to love. You know, to me, a harmonic minor might seem really full of tension and someone else might think it's the most beautiful romantic scale on earth. Um, so, you know, everybody really interprets these things differently. And, um, and like I said, I, you know, I'm always curious to offer things and then take the data and see what do people want? Um, so, you know, we tried to, make it on our website so you can see like what is the difference between the meditation Syrahs, series Syrahs, and a professional or an enthusiast series Syrahs to compare it side by side and see, oh, well, there is a difference in sustain and a difference in tone and timbre. And um, some people, I have a friend that bought an instrument whose ears were really, really sensitive and, um, and she really didn't like the stainless steel. Um, it was too much for her. It was like there was too much sound coming out um, versus, you know, that's overwhelmingly an anomaly. Um, most people are immediately captivated by it and um, prefer it um, side by side. But then, you know, like I said, when it really comes down to what are people ordering, um, maybe 60%, 65%. 70% on some months are going with stainless steel and um, still 30 or 40% are preferring the other sound. Um, so, you know, it's I, like so many things in life, Austin. It's like, what do you resonate with? What's in your heart? Um, that's really what we try to ask our customers and um, what, what's going to make them happy instead of making the decision for them. Yeah. And I think um, your website also is super informative. I'll link to it. Uh, in the show notes um, so everyone can check it out. Uh, it's really helpful and not only just kind of setting a platform for, of course, um, your shop and, and the, the hand pans that you sell, but also forming as like a blog for everything hand pans and anything you really need to know about it. I found it very useful. I'm sure anybody that kind of wants to geek out on this a little bit further, um, just go there, check it out. And also uh, for the next question, I mean, I've seen stands be used. Um, I've seen it just kind of be used in your lap. Is there really any difference? Uh, do somebody that gets a hand pan, do they need a stand? Definitely don't need one, no. Um, I typically don't use one. There are, we do carry some great stands from uh, Israel to Pantom stand. Um, if I'm gonna play more than one instrument at the same time, it's nice to have a stand. 
Um, you know, they are single scale. So um, sometimes you play two or three together and it opens up an entirely new world. That's super helpful for that. Um, if I, if I perform, if I play on the stage, I'll typically um, use a stand um, because it's easier to have a stable place to have the instrument and to mic it up and whatnot. But I mean, for hanging out in your living room, um, it's, I personally prefer to play it in my lap or to sit on the ground. I prefer to play it in my lap. I tend to be kind of like long and lanky though. And I tend to have long arms. So it's also easy to get around it. Um, I've met a couple people who are um, a bit more shorter or stouter or their arms aren't very long. Um, they sometimes will prefer to use a stand. Uh, if they're, you know, if they're five foot tall um, from their hips to their knees is not as long as I am. So maybe they can't put it in their um, lap in the same way that I can. So um, those folks often prefer a stand, but um, not necessary by any means. Okay. Yeah. I mean, these are very detailed questions, but, and it sounds like a lot of this is personalized. I just asked that because kind of the sound, just having it kind of above where the, the bottom is, maybe not sitting in your lap, but for somebody who's never t- like held a hand pan, played a hand pan, are they a heavy instrument? Are they particularly heavy? Uh, I know you guys make like a special carrying case and that's kind of where I'm leading into it. Kind of like traveling with a lot of people might be wanting to bring it around, show it to friends or I mean, once quarantine and everything's done, but. uh, (laughs) Uh, Not so bad. No, it depends on where you're traveling. Uh, The instrument itself is about seven to 10 pounds depending on the size. Uh, We build them in three sizes. Our biggest one's about 10 pounds. Um, with the case, uh, you're probably looking at maybe 12 pounds, 13 pounds, 15 at most. If you're traveling by car or you're going to the park, you're going to your friend's house, uh, they're super, super easy to travel with. Um, it gets a bit more precarious if you're say flying or going internationally. Some of the, depending on the size of it, uh, you may be able to get it into the overhead of some planes. Um, If not, you need to check it in, and in which case it's very important to have the right case for that, Um, one that you know is going to be secure. And, you know, these things are an investment. Um, You know, I I don't know of any really good quality hand pans that are even close to being under $1,000. So, you know, you can imagine you'd be a little stressed out if you're checking in your your precious baby uh, into the plane and you hope it's going to arrive and still be in one piece. And yeah. uh, when you get to wherever you're going, but um, there are some really great cases out there for um, taking care of this. We, we don't actually make any cases. We, um, I distribute in the U S for a company called Harp case technologies out of um, Italy and uh, have for about five years now. And they make a number of really great products um, for going to the park, for going to your friend's house, or for traveling internationally. Um, there's another uh, company out of Colorado that I just went I brain dead on what they're called. They make a really, really top-notch case as well that like you can drive a tractor or the thing and it's still rock solid. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's everybody's got pros and cons, right? And like, what are you after? Yeah. Are you after the lightest possible thing or the indestructible thing? Um, the ultimate option is to get one of the giant, you know, musical uh, flight cases that you see like professional musicians touring with that you could, you know, build a house out of the things. They're so indestructible, but they're not really practical for taking to the park. So, yeah. you know, you, you see each side of it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm a big time surfer and I, I know the same thing kind of goes with uh, surfboards. Um, I mean, totally. Yeah. <laughs> so um, is there, uh, I'm just kind of, kind of going down this, this road of, uh, of detailed question. Is there a special way to particularly clean them? Um, and also, are they particularly durable? Uh, it sounds like, I mean, they're made out of steel, but are, are they durable? Is there a difference between the, the normal steel and the stainless steel? Yeah, these are great questions. Um... Cleaning is pretty simple. I typically recommend rubbing alcohol. It's the main thing. Uh, as long as you don't spill battery acid on it or something, anything really acidic, um, wash it off really quickly. Um, finger oils tend to probably be the worst thing uh, overall that you know all of them deal with. Um, finger oils tend to be a little bit acidic and can rust, uh, especially on the more ceramic nature ones. Um, not as big of a deal in stainless steel. Um, but you know, some great um, oils and waxes for protecting them. Um, They're pretty durable, um, surprisingly. I, you know, I joke with people. um, Every time I sell one, you know, I tell them, if you drop it off your back, you drop it from wrist height, and you put a dent in it, like, don't worry. It's, you know, it might take a couple weeks for us to fix it and get it back to you, but it's going to be fine. It might have a little, like, battle scar 
um, from the experience uh, visually, but we, I mean, you know, we build these, we build, we build instruments out of flat metal for years. Um, we can, we can fix it. Now, if you drop it out of a moving car at 60 miles an hour, if you drop it off the second or third floor of a building, uh, yeah, probably don't even call me. Um, it's probably done for. Um, so, you know, there's a limit to, uh, can I fix it or can I completely rebuild it for you? Um, it's a different story, but overall, um, they, if they're, built well like every reputable company out there builds a very stable instrument um they'll typically hold a really solid tuning for i mean at least a at least a year or two or three depending on how they're played um if you play it i mean it is there's something to be said for playing it correctly if you play it like a hand drum uh djembe or conga or bongos or something um and you play it very forcefully and hard you're going to knock it out of tune much faster um, if you play it with a more tender touch of how they're meant to be played, which you can hear it in the instrument, it'll distort if you play it too hard. Um, then, uh, you know, I've, I've met some people that their instruments don't even slightly drift for three to five years. Um, I tell people like, if you're a professional musician, you're in the studio, you're touring, um, you're playing for thousands of people, you should probably get a tune up every six months for that half of 1% of, you know, 10th of 1% of people that play handpans. Mm. Um, for anybody else, like two or three years when you notice it, what's interesting is when they do start to drift out of tune, they all, all the notes will typically go sharp together. So it's really when you play with other people that you notice it and it kind of loses a little bit of its sparkle if things start to drift apart because a lot of the notes will interact with each other. Um, at this point, um, there's a number of people who retune instruments. Um, so, you know, when I first got into this, there were like three people in the world that anyone would trust to tune a handpan. And it was hundreds of dollars to ship it across the world to get your instrument tuned um, or to go to a handpan gathering. And hopefully there's going to be a really one of those few people are going to be there and doing tune ups for everyone, um, which is very common um, at this point. Um, with so many builders, this is one of the great boons is that now there's a number of talented um, handpan tuners out there. And it's much, much easier to get a, a tune up. And, uh, you know, some people do it for free. Some people do it for 50 bucks, 100 bucks. Like, you know, it depends on what it is um, and what the situation is. If it's, um, you know, most of my instruments, if I get a instrument to tune back, it's going to take me, you know, 10 minutes or something, 15 minutes. But if it's a repair job, it can be anywhere from, 15 minutes to I've got to cut it open and spend an hour and it's going to take two or three weeks to restabilize it and everything else. So, you know, it's a little bit different, uh, endeavor and job, but overall to answer your question, um, they are metal. They are very durable. They're not invincible, but they are quite durable. And what does tuning look like? Uh, cause I mean, like you think of tuning a guitar, but tuning one piece of, of metal, like what, what does it look like? It looks like uh, holding a little ball peen hammer. Um, I have a 16 ounce hammer that I probably know better than my own thumbs. And um, yeah, you, um, you hammer on both sides of the steel. So, you know, if you look up a, a picture online of a hand pan, um, there's a hole in the bottom. And the hole is partially for the resonance and the helm holds to come out, but it's partially so you can get your hand in it to, uh, with the hammer to tune it. And, uh, so, uh, you know, the, the membrane basically just gets a little off and the tension changes over time. And so if, if the instrument's built well, it's typically only a tap or two and it goes right back into tune. And, um, if it's built well, the instrument's been built so that it's settled into tune. And actually that if you hit it too hard and you knock it out of tune, it's going to want to pull back into tune because um, it's been stabilized there. I mean, this is why we finish an instrument, but then it sits on the um, shelves for three or four weeks stabilizing and might get tuned a handful more times so that it's really settled into being in tune. Um, but, you know, typically you'll um, just use a hammer and, um, tap a few places like you know coming back to our pringle potato chip um maybe one axis is sitting like this and maybe one axis is sitting like this um and maybe the let's see here maybe one axis wants to be a little bit more like that or a little bit more like this so you can do that with the hammer um maybe the whole overall note is flat but it wants to be just a little flatter um and maybe the tension's gotten a little off and you know, without getting 
really lost into builder talk. Um, you know, it's probably 15 or 20 techniques for how to do this and not ruin the note. Um, I should probably put a disclaimer that if you have not built hand pans and you do not have a thousand hours of tuning experience at a bare, bare, bare minimum, ideally 3000 hours of tuning experience, you should not at all try to tune your hand pan or I promise you will ruin it. I promise there is 100% confidence you will ruin it. It is, uh, it is a serious skill of experience and knowing what you're doing. And I, I have seen that happen on numerous occasions of people who um, are a little overconfident. And especially if you've seen someone tune one, you're like, oh, they just hit it a few times and it was good. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot to it. I think there's a video maybe somewhere on our website of how not to tune a handpan. And um, we had a customer that took the hammer into their own hands and really did a nasty number on it um, before finally admitting humility and writing us. And we were still able to fix it without any issues, but um, it is a skill. Yeah. That's a lesson learned for everybody here. That's that finds um, hand pans fascinating and, and interesting and has their own. <laughs> Don't tune it yourself. So that's a, it's a, it's a good uh, lesson to be learned. And as for the next step, so we kind of hit all the questions for anybody fa- like fascinated, interested in hand pans. This is super informative. Is there anything that I'm particularly missing? And then also, are there any hand pan meeting groups or gatherings or more information that people could find online? Because right now everything's kind of online, but when things clear up, maybe like a festival, you mentioned a few festivals that we could link to in the show notes. Yeah, when this pandemic's over, there's festivals happening all over the world. Um, they were very rare when I first got into it, but uh, there's a handful around the country. Um, there was one that happened here in Asheville for a while. It's not happened this year for obvious reasons. Um, it's gone on uh, nine years, 10 years uh, before that. Um, there's a great festival out in California in Joshua Tree called Pantasia. Um, there's been a festival going on up in Estes Park in Colorado the last few years. Um, there's a page on our website, this hand pan festivals. Um, there's another great website, um, Paniverse that, um, has all the festivals on it. There's a number of them in Europe as well. Don't know how many of your listeners are in Europe, uh, these days, but, um, you know, the hand pan is much more popular in Europe and there's far more builders there because it came from Switzerland and it really exploded over there a bit more than it has in the States. So there's a great festival in Greece. Um, the first one that really took off was in the UK outside of, um, London, um, Hangout UK. Um, there's a sweet little one in Holland, um, in Spain, in Portugal, um, in Russia. Uh, there's really uh, quite a few of them. Um, other resources. Um, uh, my good friend uh, Sylvain uh, Paslier, um, P A S L I E R. It's French. I'm probably butchering it. Um, he uh, he has a phenomenal uh, reference website for all things handpan. Um, his cousin, David Charrier also has a really great website. Um, they're both French. Um, and David has, um, his, his website is called master the handpan. Um, he offers online lessons and there's probably three or four people now offering online lessons and, um, and they're all really good. They're all very talented. Um, Peter Levitov and David Kukerman. Um, I really really appreciate David Charrier's. Um, he, I feel like he kind of took it to the next level when he started doing master classes with tons of other builder, other players as well. Um, so he's got master classes from um, like some of the top players in the world, um, Cabasal and um, a number of other people um, that just, you know, you don't get just one person's perspective. You, um, you really get all these different people's perspectives. So uh, those are some really great resources, I think, for learning a lot more about the handpan. Of course, the Saraz website, we uh, really tried to make it more than just like, hey, you can buy a website, you can buy an instrument here. It's um, There's a tremendous amount of information on there as well about terminology. And um, we list a number of other builders around the world, most of which we're really good friends with. It's cool that it's an industry like that where we can all be friends. Um, numerous things about festivals and building and all sorts of other details as well. Um, also, I should say Facebook. There's uh, two or three groups, um, handpan instruments, something I forget what the other ones are offhand, but if you type in handpan in Facebook, you'll find two or three groups with five or 10,000 members. And um, there's a great deal of discussion going on there as well. Um, before Facebook really took 
over, um, there was a, a handpan.org was a really great resource for an online forum, but it all really kind of transferred onto Facebook about five years ago. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome. And um, I love that there's online classes and kind of resources. It seems like this is just an awesome community of, uh, of people and builders. And um, it's really nice to also have that ability to have that online class. And I'm a big fan of online classes. You can really learn anything and you can really connect with teachers that you, you would have no chance. Like I'm right outside New York city. So, I mean, there's tons of people in New York city, but I mean, when something like this happens, it's just like you're not able to really connect with anybody. So the ability of having online courses and classes and, and meeting people and talking to uh, experts like yourself um, and really learning about something uh, and then being able to share it with other people is awesome. So, Truly. Yeah. And what's next for, for yourself and for your company, Siraz? Good question, Austin. I, um, I feel like I've settled into a place of um, cultivating as much peace in my life as possible. I, um, I'm focused right now on keeping my customers happy, um, making more fun instruments, um, I've, um, I, you know, it's a crazy time we're all in right now. I feel like this is the great retraction of 2020 and it's a time for us all to maybe find that balance between yin and yang again. You know, I feel like the world was very, uh, yang focused for the last decade and now we're all getting a forced major dose of yin to back up and witness and take things in. And so, you know, where I've spent almost the entire time of Siraz, like in deep and innovation, um, pushing the limits of notes and pushing the limits of um, what I can do on the instrument, I've kind of backed up and taking a breather and really just focusing on quality and simplicity and how do I make the very best instrument possible and um, maintain the reputation that we've built. And, um, and I think maybe put a bit more of my heart and love and soul into it then not that I haven't always done that, but that I've found a new, new caverns of that inside of myself in the last years through Qigong and through yoga and um, to put more of that into it in myself. Yeah. Every day is another day. Take it in, breathe, take in all the blessings of life, try to share them with the rest of the world. Awesome. Awesome. And, and I appreciate all this information and, and having you on the show. Uh, listeners can find sh- all your information, I- I'm sure, at your website, and uh, which we'll we'll have a link in the show notes. Um, is there anywhere else you'd like listeners to connect with you? Um, I mean, SirazHandpans.com. You have a Facebook group, Siraz Musical Instruments. Is that right? That's right. Cool. And um, yeah, is there anything else you want to share with the audience? Or I, uh, I really, really appreciate you um, having me on the show. Um, I really uh, wish many blessings to all of your listeners and I hope that they can find in themselves um, a certain sense of um, peace and mindfulness um, during this time that's um, difficult for some and um, a reset for all of us. Um, And I really hope that we can all use this time to make the world a better place to really stop and get out of our habits and our routines and, um, look around and say, what's working well and what's not working well? And how can we dial in these details and make all of our lives a little, a little better place, a little more balance in all capacities? I really, um, I really appreciate you having me on the show. Thank you all so much for being here. I am truly grateful for your time and all of you have taken part in the Secret Yogi Society to make life beautiful through bringing together a community of like-minded individuals to go about life's journey together. I appreciate you all that have left a rating and review in whichever platform you're listening to this episode right now. So if you haven't left a rating or review thus far, if you could please do so. Your reviews help push this show further and in turn directly support all those who have joined the Secret Yogi Society. For more information on the Secret Yogi Society, check out our hub, which is www.secretyogisociety.com. From there, you can find all the links to our Facebook group where we are constantly supporting each other as a community and discussing the latest episodes, our Instagram, where we have short, thoughtful quotes and reflections from recent guests, and finally, our newsletter, which is a list of upcoming events, free life yoga classes, and meditations, and a lot, lot more. So all this will be in the show notes below, and have an amazing day. Namaste. Namaste.